it's a treat to be here. Um, Tad Patsick asked me to come today, and he wants to just embarrass me in front of all of you on the panel. So, Tad, uh, I can't wait for that to happen. I enjoyed the story about Governor Bush. Actually, just don't tell it to him, because in 2004, he actually thinks he's been, he'd been president for four years. Uh, so, Governor Perry might get a little worried, and if you haven't heard, actually, Governor Perry carries a laser-sighted pistol in his boot. So don't tell that story to him, because he thinks he's been governor since 2000. <laughs> um, anyway, so welcome to Texas. Um, <laughs> here we go. Where's the clicker? Hey, there we go. Okay. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Mountain or molehill? Okay, so let me, let me do something I like to start this way. This is population in the world, and this is energy consumption. So energy is about people, and everybody in this room knows that, and it's a, it's a complicated story, but in, it, in its simplest form, the only reason we talk about this is because humans demand energy, and it's been tracking pretty steadily as we've passed seven billion people now and continue to head up. So I do this in three parts. I'm gonna look at gas just for a second because I think the unconventional oil story is educated by the unconventional gas reservoir story, to frack or not to frack, then we'll look at some oil. And I'm focused mostly on the U.S. because that's what I was asked to do. And a quick look at options. This is uh, natural gas production in the U.S. It, it uh, did look like it peaked in the 70s, but it plateaued and now has come back up, as have reserves, and they continue to head up. If we focus in on that last 20 years, it was built this way. Here's the non-associated onshore associated with oil, Alaska, and the non-associated offshore. Sure, that, that would be the con so-called conventional gas. Um, and you could argue, yeah, in fact, it did peak if you wanted to find gas that as conventional reservoirs. Tight gas, coal bed methane, and now shale gas, kind of the latest player, except for the Antrim, which has been around for a long time. So that's a little different look when you throw them all together and we come into the shales and, and just because I've been told that not everybody in here is of the oil and gas industry. You know, hydraulic fracturing is a big deal uh, in this country, and it's a big political deal. In fact, the, the students of Harvard just voted yesterday, 72%, I think the highest consensus they've ever had, that Harvard University should remove all oil and gas related stocks from its uh, endowment portfolio. And they were, that's even a higher vote than for apartheid. So that's Harvard. And the, and the administration in Harvard sort of is shaking its head a little bit. I don't know what the response will be. I guess you can do that when you have a $30 billion portfolio for 3,000 kids. But uh, interesting. So fracking is a big part of this. You drill down a mile or two. You drill laterally for a mile or two now. You inject fluids into there at pressure, enough to overcome the, the hydrostatic and overburden pressures, and you crack the rock, and you crack the rock in a zone that is intended to be sort of, this is, this is to scale, this drawing. Um, you know, you stage them out and you, and you see disruptions. If you kind of take that to some real looking data, this is the Marcellus, I show that intentionally, and you can see the freshwater zone on top at about down to almost 1,000 feet. And then the disrupted zone, hydrologic fracturing, fracturing with the wells that were drilled to date here, it is, it disrupting up to a, a thousand feet um, above those well depths. And in their shallowest, they're still, apologize for this, but it does make a kind of an interesting visual. They're about three Empire State buildings away from the freshwater zone. So the hydraulic fracturing itself has been confused with other things that go on at the surface that do have the potential to get into groundwater, but often more local. So we come back to the U.S. shale gas, and this is not, um, this is not working. Oops, there we go. This is not a forecast. These are actual data for the various shale plays in the U.S. Uh, Barnett being the big one in blue there and others that are starting to come on. And we'll see where they head. But it's five T's a year, 5, 000, 5 trillion cubic feet per year, which is about a quarter of the U.S. production. And pretty steeply growing. People say, we didn't know about this. Actually, we did. I was in the oil and gas business for quite a while myself. and used to sit on wells. You take a shale core, and there's always a gas kick. You, know, you knew it was there, just couldn't produce it economically um, like in places you can today. 
And here's a forecast from our friend Ken Medlock over at Rice and their model. So that shows now out to 2040 in the U.S. with the uh, five TCFs on the left there around 2011 and where they think it could go up to almost triple that with various plays listed on the right hand side there. And then they actually do one globally with the U.S. being the dark blue, the only place really producing shale gas today. But other countries that have potential resource bases coming on out of the future and heading toward 50 to 60 TCF and increasing and that's out of 2040. Just a model. And can it be the first to say there's a lot of assumptions in the model and every model I ever show I say the only thing I know about it is it's wrong in its forecast but you try to talk about some of the things that are in it and some of the basis for that. So we come back here and let's just look at the Barnett. I am a geologist so you're going to suffer those of you who aren't. Here's a rock, you know, a picture of a rock. This is this is the Barnett and the pore system. This is done at the Bureau of Economic Geology. A lot of people are doing this neat stuff now, but these are the pores. And the scale here is 200 nanometers in the lower right hand corner, or, or two tenths of a micron. Those little burnt orange basketballs are 20 nanometers across. So you could take a hypothetical pore throat with methane molecules, one carbon and four hydrogens, and scale those to this scale. And, and so watch close doesn't quite go away for those in the front. You can actually see at the molecular level, some of these pore throats are now 20 molecules wide. A human hair, not really colored to look like one, about 50 microns wide though. And we'll scale that same picture onto the human hair at the same scale. So watch the pores and the barnet. There you have it. So this is not the world that my dad grew up in, he's a geologist, or that I grew up in, or that we the faculty grew up in. We don't understand this a whole lot better than our students. I think Tad would agree. We're all learning it together. Um, it's a very different world. There's stratigraphy and sedimentology in it. There's interesting permeability and flow equations. They may be Darcy's Law or something like it, or they may not, uh, et cetera. It's a very different world, and, and we're down here in the in the shale or the kitchen. The, oil, the conventional oil and gas, I say with smilingly, is, is just what leaked off. And the shale is the source where most of it resides in various forms. So this is the Barnett. This is work that we've been doing. I'm not gonna dwell on this, but I do wanna show you, oops, how do you go back? Page, up oh, there it is. That's not working. Got it. Here we go. I want to show you what 16,300 wells looks like. So in the lower uh, corner, left corner, you see the years ticking off there. And this is when George Mitchell bought it from Jack Jackson, actually, who named our school, uh, and was developing it with vertical wells, a triangle or vertical wells. Blue colors are lower production. As they get hotter, uh, they're going to be higher production. As you get up into 2002 and 3, they'll become circles, and those are the first horizontal wells. Here they come, same color scheme. All right, there you go. Over, under, under and around Dallas and under the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport if you landed there, et cetera. And you can see the so-called sweet spots that are bright colors. They're not. They're not spots. They're pretty heterogeneous, actually, when you get right down into it. But there are areas that we're, we've been able to work on and figure out productivity tiers and interesting dynamics there. A lot less drilling in this play than there was when the gas price was higher. But production hasn't changed that much. Why? Because they're drilling the wells in the better tiers now. Fewer wells, better production than the total of when they were drilling out in that blue area. Okay? It won't last forever. But our work shows that there's actually more wells to drill in the good rock than people originally thought. The drainage areas are smaller and the recovery factors higher than what has been done. You see that same sort of density work going on in other basins where they actually drill the wells, they call them experiment, density drilling experiments, and they'll drill 20 wells or 20, more than 20 in a section, a square mile, and not lose much rate in the better rock. So it's an interesting and evolving learning that's going on. Look, there's implications to all this. There's traffic noise light. There's a lot of water that gets used relative to agriculture. Not much. Relative to water demand. Yes, it's a lot. 
particularly wherever, wherever you are in the basin, like in our Eagle Fort in South Texas. There's land, a lot of land, uh, natural occurring radioactive materials, methane uh, leaks, lots of studies going on on that. The one that just came out of MIT yesterday, I think, um, saying, hmm, not as high as folks thought, uh, earthquakes and carbon. Energy security. You know, you balance this against energy security. Is it available, affordable, reliable, and is it clean, or is it environmental? Nothing is perfect. So this is the trade-offs that go on in this country over shale, and it kind of reminds me of this picture. Um, I say this is the EPA, and we're here to help you. That's our Environmental Protection Agency. It's actually the winner of the last photo taken contest. Uh, <laughs> here is the runner-up of that same contest. So, the last photo taken, if the former was the EPA, this is the oil and gas industry. And they're saying, hey, look what we found, hydrofracking. You know? And people are saying, hey, guess what's behind you, the public. And they kind of want to know what you're doing, right? And they should be able to. So what do you do about this? This is a, our sister campus up in Arlington, and that's a horizontal well that's being drilled. They didn't want to drill on their campus, so this one sent 19 laterals out from one platform. In fact, they go down and turn, they turn again. It's possible, it's expensive, but you can sure reduce the surface footprint as you move forward and will. You, when you make Dilbert, you've made the big time. We're gonna start fracking under our biggest competitor's headquarters. My plan is to pollute their water and generate earthquakes to destroy their campus. The project code name is Fracking Awesome. <laughs> and Dilbert says, catchy, you know. Barnett's not the only shale in the world. Everybody shows this. There's a lot of shale in the North America. There's a, and these are not all the shales in the world. These are some of the bigger ones. Who resists shale gas? It's interesting when you dig deep. Turns out Russia doesn't like it so much. They have a lot of conventional gas they need to sell to Europe. And the Middle East doesn't like it so much yet. They've got some fairly large trains in the Ross Gas Project in Qatar. Uh, Europe is mixed on it. I would say some of you are actually confused about it. Uh, whether or not you like shale gas or not. Uh, but the rest of the world seems to be reasonably positive on this resource. And we can talk about that in the panel. So let's go to oil, or sorry, wrap up gas here. This is what's been produced all in in the world. And to the right of that line is more expensive on the left versus resources, not reserves. And you're looking at an estimate, again, it's just an estimate, about four times as much unconventional resource reservoirs as has been produced to date. Natural gas is going to be more expensive. It's not in the US. There's a certainly a supply. And how about our ability to forecast then? These are the unconventional gas forecasts by the Natural Petroleum Council on which I sit in the right uh, potential gas committee and several other forecasts that have come in. And you can see the trend, it's doubled in, the, in a decade. As you start to learn more about things, often they do double. I see in the front. So unconventional oil. Here's the US production. Um, we like to vertically exaggerate it. It's easier to see that way. And the peak that happened, in fact, that was built with that peak, um, the, the more lower 48 in blue. And then you add Alaska, and you add offshore Gulf of Mexico. So it's interesting when you add more area to it. But there's also some peaks on, on the right. Same kind of plot, what we've produced to the left in oil. And then estimates of what's out to the right. Conventional is about 2x, more expensive. And, then you, and why are they more expensive? They're uh, higher pressures. They're, they're higher temperatures. Things get more expensive. It's, I wouldn't say the easy oil has been found. My dad was in the business for 40 years. He said it was bloody hard to find that oil. We had crappy old well logs and crappy old seismic. It was hard to find. It wasn't easy. It's just more expensive and more technology. Definitely more expensive. And then you got your shale oil stuff sitting out here. Again, a couple X. This is the US production again. And out on the far right, you see that little, what looks kind of small, that's about 500,000 barrels a day. Texas and North Dakota, the Bakken and the Eagle Ford of what built that. There's our, our demand uh, reduction because of the recession. But you see the little bit of turnaround in production, so you're importing 10% less than used to, and maybe heading toward even less imports agree that we probably won't get to, with Ray, that we won't get to an oil exporter in the U.S. anytime soon. 
These are forecasts, but they just go out about 10 years. This is the same, I think, um, that Laura showed, the Reistat energies. And I'm, I've superimposed on here the IRRs at 10%. So the, what are the costs? From about 45 bucks a barrel to $70 a barrel. And you're looking at close to 4 million barrels a day in 10 years from the shales, if this forecast is plus or minus right. Go back to this, what would that look like then at the same scale, time scale, and vertical scale? That's what that would look like. Um, and I've shifted it down a bit to account for decline of other things, although some of them are holding steady with EOR and some other things as well. They're starting to horizontally drill and fracture conventional reservoirs now, which is having an interesting result. So that's, a, a, you know, believe it or not believe it, it's a forecast, uh, some data sit behind it. How do we do an oil prediction through time? Well, these, the colors are all the same people or the same groups. And you can see, I'll just put a few on here. Let's put a bunch on here. You know, again, like unconventional gas, there's been a trend over the last 60 years of our forecast up on a low and a high end. It won't last forever, but I think we need to be candid with our own forecasts that they tend to go up through time so far. I'm not gonna dwell on this because I'm out of time, but you know, there are options. We can talk about them, but the bottom line is we can either do that, you know, or that. That's the world, though. The world, these are pictures from today. They aren't from antiquity. You know, we, we have 2,000 horsepower in the back of our boat, and we've got uh, ox pulled the vehicles. So that's the transportation world we have to deal with. I couldn't agree more that transportation fuels are what we need to talk about, Bob. No form of energy is perfect. I'll leave you with this thought on that. that I'm not much of a calamity guy, to be honest with you. You know, here's a guy that leaves from taking pictures in the Grand Canyon by jumping. He's in flip-flops. <laughs> Apparently he slipped and almost fell, the photographer reports. So we'd all agree with one thing. This guy's an idiot, right? <laughs> Why not build a little bridge out to that future and kind of look for a, a bit more stable way to get there? And I look forward to our panel and some of those conversations. Thanks. <laughs>